This is James M. Ward here, and D&D experts like myself love listening to the Save or Die podcast because I learn something new every time I tune in. You burst through the door, you find a small room filled with gold and jewels, and a red dragon, he starts to breathe, Save or Die! The Save or Die Podcast, a podcast about classic Dungeons and Dragons. Bring on your goblin holes and band of oaks, hulking zombies and bows, and on your little troll, don't slow me down, oh no. About five I heard seconds. some thunder. Yeah. Yeah. So if okay. I, well, if, if I we disappear, you, you three get okay, to do go. the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so, Clint, what did you buy in gaming this week? <laughs> you see what I did there? Whisper in Venom, yeah. <laughs> no, buy. No, what, not what did you play in gaming. What did you do in gaming this week? What, what did what, you buy in gaming this week? What, yeah. what, you mean part money with? Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, she said whisper in Venom. I'm like, no, no, buy, not, not uh, give it. <laughs> okay. All righty. Chowdy, everybody. It's Save or Die, number 90. Now I'm hungry. And Mike. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> and with me and hungry is DM Glenn. I love some clam chowdy right now. DM Jim. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> DM Liz. Hello. And a special guest, Bad Mike. Mike Botolato. Yes. yes, bad and, Mike, the opposite of good Mike. Yes. yes. <laughs> Who is that? I don't think anybody gets on OSR Gaming when I sign as DM Good Mike anymore. Cause no, it's, it. it's just being you, Mike. Nobody else gets it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm sorry, Mike. I'm sorry, Mr. Stewart. It's a shtick now, and I look forward <laughs> to it. Well, thanks. Yeah, I feel like I can't stop anymore. It's like, well, no, no it's a tradition. i got to stick with it. Anyway, now it is Botolato, right? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm at see see everybody. I'm asking at the beginning this time. Because <laughs> right. at Not the end of the last the show, end. at the end of the last show, we were still thinking thanking Janelle Jackways. <laughs> oh like no! It's like uh, it's Jakeways. It's like why didn't you tell us at the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> we were just blindly going along, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh well. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the other one says to a, <laughs> to a Galliano, I'd be better at that, but oh well. Hey, I should have been better about asking, but, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Ah, those frogs. Anyway. Anyway, yeah, this episode, we are going to be covering a lesser gnome publication's work, Whisper and Venom. Yay. Woo-hoo. We're looking at both the box set and the hardback, although we're, it's basically the same thing. It's more just presentation. Mm-hmm. And... uh I swear, it is Zach, is it Glazer? Zach. Glazer, yes. Glazer, Zach yeah. Glazer. Thought, wait, 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 it is wait, his wait, lifelong got, goal to make me like gnomes. I, I think swear, it's, I think it's, it's got to be. I'm looking at the name. I think it's Glazar. G-L-A-Z-A-R. Now that sounds metamorphosis, Alfie. <laughs> Glazar the Barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be and your it, next character. It is. It is. Even if we're not playing Metamorphosis Alpha. <laughs> it's, or by, it's by Zach Glazar and John Hemmerly. Yes. And we'll be talking about that. But first, we're going to talk about what we've been doing in gaming this week. Bad Mike. Well, I'm going to let you know what I've been doing in gaming because as part of it relates to the convention. See, I'm going to drop in all these little convention. Uh-huh. Uh, if you don't, you will. There. Yes. I, I see what you Maybe I should have waited. Oh, well. <laughs> Well, um, I, I actually didn't do any face-to-face gaming, but I did spend a lot of time playing uh, Tower of Doom video game. Oh, no. Uh, console, the console game, which we now own a copy of, the uh, NTRPG Con. Uh, Doug bought a copy, and we have it hooked up in our warehouse. Uh, and so You have a warehouse? 
Yes, we have – actually, we have four storage units. We have so much junk. If you've ever been to the convention, you've seen all the stuff we have. And two of them um, filled up with your, your uh, games. It's, so. it's, it's like a, it's a gamer paradise. It's <laughs> goodies. I'm seeing but, this Indiana uh, Jones space. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. It's just, it's just boxes and boxes. Top I don't know what's in men. them. <laughs> <laughs> but we but we, but we have a uh, tower. Uh, no, we have a uh, Tower of Doom, uh, the old arcade game. It's for we have a four player version. Uh, Doug got it. We hooked it up. We played it several times. It is really really fun, and we're going to bring it to the convention. So mm-hmm. my grandson and I went out last night and killed about two hours um, uh, playing and eventually winning the game, which is something I couldn't do back in the day because I did not have fifteen thousand quarters back in the day, which. <laughs> We, we figured out if you actually have to put quarters in the machine, there's no way you could have finished the game without spending at least a hundred dollars. So, mm. wow. um, are, we, are, we, are we going to have to spend fifteen thousand dollars worth of quarters? Oh no, probably not fifteen thousand. We'll we'll knock it down a little bit. No, I, actually, fourteen nine ninety nine. Exactly. No, it'll be free. I think it'll be free. Uh, we haven't talked about it yet. I don't think we actually can get it to work with quarters at this time. So, uh, we're probably just going to have it free. But it will be there along with some other. Uh, goodies. We may have a pinball machine or two, and maybe perhaps another arcade game. We're not sure yet, but Bad but mind. yeah, that was that was my gaming experience mm. this week. Galaga, get Galaga. <laughs> oh, Liz, how could you say that? Gauntlet. <laughs> no, Galaga. Elf eats food badly. <laughs> Warrior is about to die. No, Strider. <laughs> now, Bad Mike is 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 your next goal to get the other stand up D and D game. Oh, Glenn, you're way ahead of me, aren't you? There. Yeah, yes. Yes. Like, we, we're trying to get t- Tower of Mister, or is it Mistara? World of Mist. What's what's the other one called? I can't remember. Tower of Doom and uh, Shadow over Mistara. Shadow of Mistara. Yeah. We actually have a. It's real. It's some kind of technical BS. We we actually have the game board. We have to install it into the machine. So uh, once we find somebody to do that, we should have that also. So we'll, we'll, we'll have both games available. Now you know what would really wow. be cool. You know, it'd be really cool have an emulator or an old Mac Plus and have somebody have Dark Tower there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Return to Dark Town. Those were great <laughs> games. I love the mutants. <laughs> so anyway, it was, it was sort of a D&D fix, not quite. It's, uh, it, it does use the D&D rules, uh, and it's uh, the spells do just what they do in the book, and they certain spells don't work against Undead, and it, it works just like – the rules are just the same as D&D, but that was the closest I've come to playing D&D in a while. It was, it was fun. We had a- It'll get you by. Okay. Cool. All righty. Then how about we find out from DM Glenn? Yes. Oh, I thought you were going to point to Liz. Oh, ho, 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 ho. we had our Labyrinth Lord game yesterday at my house. Mm. Yeah, we got to fight a Hydra. Really? Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, you didn't get in trouble for that? No, not at all. Not at all. Cool. Um, kids were in the other room. We were playing. We all had a good time. Got to fight a Hydra. And um, Hydra's Always fun. Are, yeah, let's see. He came out. He came out with eight heads. <laughs> mm. That was fun. We knocked. We finally got him knocked out. I did the killing blow with my uh, spiritual hammer. So I was. I had fun with that. And then he started. Then he tossed a couple of ogres at us that were insanely hard to beat. He stopped the. He stopped the game in the middle of the fight, saying, "I got to retool these." <laughs> I don't think, because now there's ogres, okay? Yeah, because because it's like you guys. I'm going to do a TPK if I don't. It's it's because he said. I said, are you going to be publishing this? He says, yeah, I need to retool them so I know how much. It's like, like we're just a test group now, right? <laughs> we're not yes. doing a campaign. We're a test group for your modules, right? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> fine. Yeah, go play that game. And, Ain't nothing wrong with that. And let's see what else. Um, I got me a copy of Mutant Future and Crypt World, which uh, we'll talk after the show, Mike. Um, I've got the zombie version, Rot World. Oh, do you? Well, yeah. Uh, Pretty cool. We'll talk later. That uh, Mutant Future, <laughs> and I down- also downloaded and printed out the Thundar the Barbarian supplement, getting ready for uh, North Texas's Thundar game. Woo! And my my friend, my DM Matt's going to play. I'm dying to watch him play a mock. Glenn, I'm not sure you're. I'm not sure you're pronouncing that right. You have to enunciate the extra R. Thundar. 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 Kind of like a pirate. Thundar. Our. Our lords of light. Anyway. <laughs> uh, 
demon <laughs> dogs. <laughs> they are machines. Anyway, that's yeah. what I've been doing. Um, Speaking okay. of Thundar, you know. Michael Elizabeth Roy! <laughs> <laughs> I was I was so excited to see the Thundar the Barbarian game session at North Texas this year until I realized it was starting at 8 a.m. It's like, there is no way I'm waking up <laughs> early enough to be able to play in that game. It's like, forget it. I'm, t- I'm taking a chance. I got I to gotta do my game that evening. Like, so ah. it's like, I'm going to be at the auction. I'm going to be up in the room going, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Glenn, <laughs> just don't fall down in the shower again. Yeah, I was going to say, do me a favor. Take your time getting ready that morning. I yeah. will. Every morning. Or at least mix okay. it up. You know, this time break a leg or something. You know, don't break an arm. Just... Yeah, we can wheel you around that way. Yeah. Sure. Hey, you know, my, my, my medical insurance needs some exercising sometimes. So. <laughs> we'll bring a hey, piece of hey, the ho- Hey, the hotel paid for my medical so mm. you know, I'm, now I'm thinking. Hey, well, that's cool of them. It's 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 the uh, yeah. It was the don't sue us payoff. Uh, <laughs> Whatever works. Well, yeah. Liz, could you shove me down the stairs this year? I'd like to see if we get some ballrooms for free. So um, <laughs> sure, I, I can do that. <laughs> great, great. Mike, no, I'll do it. Then I can claim I didn't see you. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That would hold up in court. Well, sure. now we've talked about it on a podcast. It's probably not a good idea. Oh, so. we, uh, no. we, can, we can edit that out. Yeah, edit okay. this out, would you? Yeah. Hey, sure. hey Mike. The uh, Saver Die podcast does not endorse fraud. <laughs> <laughs> or pushing people downstairs. A little larceny, maybe, but not fraud. That's where we draw the line. Hey, Mike, I heard this I heard this uh, rumor that in twenty fifteen we get the whole hotel. That is true. Uh uh we finally we fi- we already signed the contract for next year. Uh-huh. And we will get the entire hotel next year, all the boardrooms. So we have we'll have no normals there. It's all gonna be freaks. Ah, ah, ah. Uh, well, I'm going to go somewhere else then. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be able, we won't be able to freak out the straits anymore. It's all going to be uh, – the hotel will be 100% well, there will be one or two. There will be so, one or two so we stragglers. Can, we can turn on our own and try and freak them out. I was hoping there would be like a Christian retreat there at the same time and see what happened. Oh, stop it. Well, remember <laughs> I mentioned about that CoastCon we went to where they were having the cheerleader camp in the same – in the same hotel building. Well, that's wonderful, actually. That, oh, I mean, that's terrible, yeah. That was <laughs> weird. Anyway, Jim, what have you been up to? Uh, we played in my Mutant Crawl Classics campaign last night, and I just couldn't be happier. I, we've reached that point where I, which, that I love where a campaign really starts to gel, and all of a sudden, you know, everybody's like, you kind of get that family vibe going. Everybody's oh, yeah. really in it. You know, I, I don't know if that makes sense. And we just yeah. had a, uh, we just had a, a and well, in fact, two of my players are about to have a baby, so they're creating their own characters on the side. Uh, Great fan players. One of those fantastic battles with the post-apocalyptic version of fighting a dragon. I, uh, they're, they, uh. they crashed far from home. They've got like a week-long hike to try and get back where they are, and I hit them with an air squid from uh, that oh, old you... All the World's Monsters. Monsters, yeah. And uh, a about half the party died, but they had metapacks and a metabot that they had salvaged and mastered the prior game. So, you know, the, the air squid is killing a couple of them around, and the metabots are running around bringing them back as fast as they die. <laughs> hey, Liz. In other words, it's not a Jim Ward. Yeah. What? Because your guys actually survived. <laughs> Wasn't that a Thundercats episode? I'm- well, we've discovered we're because the primary rule set is DCC. We discovered we've been running something uh, incorrectly, which is every time that happens, you're supposed to lose a permanent stamina point. And uh, so we will be doing that, enforcing that rule in the future. But I didn't feel like it was fair to do in the middle of the game. So, kind of the AD and D resurrection bit. Yeah, yeah, just like that. Ah, okay. So eventually, it's gonna it's gonna have a cost. Um, and uh, but just a. A lot of fun like that, and uh, I have uh, decided to start running a first edition Metamorphosis Alpha campaign and threw it out to my guys that, you know, we would be doing that. Anybody wants to be in that campaign, you get first crack at it, not expecting seven people to turn right around and go, we're all in. So wow. <laughs> so now it's on me. We're going to see if Jim can run two campaigns at the same time. Congrats. <laughs> But you know, just usual mutant mayhem. They uh, they got uh, uh, 
one of my favorite players, Marcos, has a giant uh, mutant orangutan with a cybernetic arm that's got a 24 strength. And after oh. like 10 rounds of, you know, trying to pop shots up in the sky at this thing and missing half the time, he finally realized it was a better idea to climb one of the tentacles up to the body and just start punching it to death. So they finally, <laughs> <laughs> so they finally killed it. <laughs> Sweet. That's nice. Okay. All right, Liz. It's... Time for the Mike Liz story. The Mike Liz story. Woohoo. Well, um, we did our second edition game yesterday. Um, uh-huh. Our DM is currently leading us through what is actually a mixture of Temple of Elemental Evil, Return to Temple of Elemental Evil, and the Hackmaster module, Temple of Existential Evil. So <laughs> he's have just. A lot. That's a lot of evil. Yeah, well, he's. Picking and choosing three different modules, and putting and it all to- yeah, and putting it all together into his own adventure. So there's no way anyone is going to know what the heck is going on, <laughs> even if they've gone through any of the three, because he's just mixing it all up. You know, I don't think Tim burned anyone to death. No, last game. no. Yeah, that's I almost for him. did. Yeah, but he didn't. That's amazing. <laughs> what I like about adventures that take place in a tomb is if you die, funeral's already taken care of. You're in a tomb. Yeah, there you there go. You yeah, go. Just, yeah. just, just shove him Tossies. in an alcove. Yeah, he'll be fine. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so we were we haven't actually made it to the temple yet. We're at an abandoned moat house um, outside of the small town, which of is course. not Hamlet. It's not. The town of not Hamlet. Otherwise known as Timondar. Um, anyway, so we're there. We're cleaning it out, finding some stuff. Uh, I'm running a cleric, a morning lord of the god Lathander. And Preston, our paladin, is also a worshiper of Lathander. Um, often our characters will find themselves teaming up regarding the actions which should take precedence over others. And in this last session, we found an evil obelisk emanating a powerful cold, which was both physical and spiritual. And the paladin and the cleric both wanted to figure out a way to destroy it. And we This thing is 100 feet tall, by the way. Yes, and it would almost certainly kill us all if we managed to do it. But we're still trying to work it out, and the rest of the party's going, uh, we're going to go up, you know, out of here. You two figure that out. <laughs> we'll You're be outside. Uh, here's some rope and a tackle. Good luck to you. See ya. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. And Preston's paladin he was just going to charge right in and my cleric at least was able to get him it's like uh let's let the others leave first before we do this <laughs> like oh okay <laughs> um we couldn't figure out a way to destroy the obelisk but we did settle on destroying some evil runes that were carved into the marble in the chamber and both of us were working on it with Dispel Evil, and then I tried to strike it with my Rod of Smiting, and that didn't work. Um, mm-hmm. This backlash of evil energy attacks my cleric when she tries to strike at the symbol, and she loses six wisdom points in oh. one, one boom. Ouch. Yeah. Permanently? Um, I think they're coming back, but our DM hasn't said yet. He says, I, I, I feel a little bit better now than I did after, you know, it happened first. I'm just so. happy that somebody has a wisdom lower than mine. I know. I started out with a 17 wisdom. I lost six of them just Ooh. doing that. You, and can then, pop, you can pop me for 90% of my hit points in a battle, and I don't really care. But when stat loss starts happening, you have my attention. Oh, yeah. Um, anyway, yep. lose six wisdom points. Symbol is still there. Not not even a chip on it. But with her lowered wisdom, my cleric thought it was quite reasonable to try this again. And so she uses stone shape to try to mar the carving. And that one actually worked, but she lost another wisdom point doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so she's now got a 10 wisdom and probably isn't a terribly good cleric anymore. But 
Hopefully they'll come back. So, so at this point, I, I, I've had pets wiser than you, is what you're saying. Pretty much, yeah. Liz, Liz, I you probably won't get this, but just say dur. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> dur. Ten, yeah. ten is just average. Ten's not like suddenly, you know, you're in the tea party or anything. Yeah, but um, <laughs> but words, you know, we're we're leaving the. We're, we're finally leaving the moat house, and my character's saying to Mike's character, he's playing a female elf, and it's like, have you noticed that the paladin has a really cute butt? <laughs> and she's going, no, I can't say that I have. It's like, I didn't either until now. <laughs> I'm determined to do very unwise things That's now. Right. I, I think this is a good idea to hit on the paladin now. I didn't think of this before, but now I'm convinced it may be. <laughs> That's kind of creepy. We we both work for the same god, after all. <laughs> yeah, so much in common. I know. So, <laughs> so that was that was pretty much what happened as far as my character was concerned. <laughs> yep. Did you survive, Mike? Yeah, yeah. Um, hasn't even suffered any major issues, although the guy playing the paladin is hinting that simply for comedic effect, he's considering having his paladin start to try to court my elf. Oh. <laughs> After seeing her naked and covered in blood in that tavern a few weeks ago. Man, you're apparently can, that I, really turned him on. <laughs> I, apparently. I, I can see, see it now. He goes after the elf and Liz's cleric suddenly becomes a stalker for the paladin. You're jealous. <laughs> yes. Is it just me, or did this campaign go Rocky Horror Picture Show real quick? It, it, it's getting weird. It's getting weird. <laughs> it's getting weird. All right, well, about the only thing I was going to mention, and this is, it's to do with gaming. It's not a direct game, but I was browsing uh, blogs last week, and I came across the blog, a blog called <laughs> Stalking, Stalking the Dungeon. I've heard of that one by Darva Shriver, and she did a very interesting post on April 10th <clears throat> called Classic D&D Class Options, and I just thought I'd mention this because it really hit home a point that I've heard a lot too, is she was saying that she, a lot of times her players or players in general don't want to play Classic because they say there's not enough class choice mm. as there is in advanced D&D. Or is there an infinite choices so she started making a list of all the classes that were available in brown book holmes mulvey cook menser the gazetteers the creature crucibles etc etc i stopped counting at a hundred <laughs> <laughs> and yeah yeah it's kind of like okay yeah you want to talk well there's not enough options Dun dun dun. And this is just basic stuff, basic products, right? Yeah, this is classic. Yeah. yeah you know, okay. original or BX master RC type stuff. Yeah, this is not a D&D. Right. Okay. Just want to make that clear. <laughs> yeah. Because that's the complaint. Well, AD and D has all these options, whereas the you know, quote unquote classic does not. Oh, of course, contraire. You, of course, if you want to play devil's advocate. A lot of those came out around the time they split into basic and, and advanced, and I always felt that one was looking over the other's shoulders. I don't know which one, but it's like, oh, we can maybe we ought to adapt that to this, like to basic or something like that. Mm, so I, I felt in like basic, some ways. I felt and like to be fair, a lot of these class options are race as class. Right. Um, the, at least I'd say maybe a third of them, maybe. The, the race as classes? <laughs> was that one of them yeah you wouldn't every gazetteer pretty much every gazetteer would have its own class too right yeah i think when she did the list of gazetteers there was always at least one right. sometimes yeah. three or four yeah so yeah there's there's a lot of options out there and i will put a link in the show notes for everyone to go take a look at it yourself okay hey mike before we go to emails can i do a blog shout out shout out sure um eric Tenkar over at Tenkar's Tavern just today hey. put up a blog post uh, announcing his intention to create a little sidebar with all the best OSR podcast. And and doing that, he's like, well, I, here are the ones I listen to. I know I'm missing some. And he put his in the blog post his list down, and it was all the WGP podcast, including Save or Die, Spellburn, Thaco's Hammer, Roll for Initiative, <laughs> and Dead Game Society. So, Eric, thank you, sir, 
super oh, long. Now, now I got to now I got to plug them on the other show tomorrow. Indeed. Here, yeah, That's yeah thank you, Eric. And it's it's still running. I think all the submissions have been done, but he was also doing the OSR Superstar competition for magic items. I didn't know about that. Which uh, I submitted a couple to. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how that resolves we'll out. for you, Mike. Oh, thanks. Can we one, of, one of them was basically a magical Burger King crown, so I'm not sure oh, how, how far that's. Stop, can we oh, I want the, that. <laughs> can we stuff the ballot box and stuff? The crown of the bourgeois king. <laughs> <laughs> so, you wake up in the morning, you have this Burger King guy staring at your face. Give me the money. <laughs> Copyright. <laughs> Have breakfast with the king. <laughs> Thank you. And, Thank you. And, and by the way, just to just to let everybody know, uh, Eric will be at NTRPGCon this year. Yes. Sweet. Oh, he will. So if you want to see him, say hi, talk about his blog, he will be there to discuss that, I'm assuming. <laughs> Excellent. He'll want, to talk about, he'll want to talk about gaming-related subjects there. Maybe we can get an interview with him, or at oh. least a quick chat with him. on. Just sit at um, a table, toss some dice, and kill his character. Oh, that too. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, Frank ain't. Lord, He's still Lord, on. Lord. Yeah. Anyway. Do we have any emails? Yes, we do. Get down, get down. Get down, get down. The Save or Die email hot tub time machine. Come here, you scrumptious little beauty. Here I go once again with the email. Every week, I hope that it's from a female. Oh, man. Well, let's talk about them, shall we? Eight Indeed. Honest. All righty. Our first email is from Kevin Long. Hi mm. again, Kevin. <laughs> Hello. And this time, Kevin writes, hi, guys and Liz. I was just listening to show number 64. I know that was a long time ago, just over a year. But there are two things I want to say about that show. First is, Liz... All six of my 1E characters have a male and female blink dog. In the, <laughs> in the dungeon we were in, we needed them to help us make our way through the hallway room because there was no way to make light. And second They're is... They're guide dogs. <laughs> second is the paladin. I think a good paladin would understand that with e with that. Ah, sorry, <clears throat> let me try that again. <laughs> I think a good paladin would understand that without evil, there would be no him. So at points, would travel with an evil person and would be okay with others doing things to goblins and other monsters to get the info they needed. Mm -hmm. Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Discuss. Well, well I, I'm, I'm thinking with each having a male and female blink dog, they're trying to get enough treasure to open a breeding farm. <laughs> hey, you could sell blink dog puppies for amazing amounts of gold pieces. That's Especially true. to people who are about to go into B1 and search yeah. the unknown, maybe. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he didn't say they were fixed, so, you know. <laughs> well, they're kind of intelligent. Would, would you want to be the one to tell the blink dog that they need to have a little procedure done <laughs> no, 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 no. no and the dog just looks at you, <laughs> no, I put looks the dog at you like you're a criminal I'm i put the I'm dog thinking, food though, away. i'm thinking if you breed them that's a very easy delivery for the female blink dog though because they just that's teleport true. out of the womb <laughs> well having to, having puppies around it's like, i put the i put the dog food away why is it gone again <laughs> No matter where we hide it. Yeah. Those dogs will be impossible to discipline. You go after one with a rolled up newspaper, and the next thing you know, they're on the other side of the room. And then you know, oh, they, they'd, be laughing, they'd be wearing you out. Imagine yeah. what would happen if you had to put a leash on them. We got leash laws around this new place. I mean, we have to have dogs on a leash. That wouldn't happen. <laughs> yeah. All right. Back to Paladins. No, the, the Hobbit. Anybody want to take this? No. Well, Hobbit, I will say that that's a good way for that's a good way for a paladin to keep his job, you know, encourage evil in others, and then when they do something bad, he chops their head off. He goes, "Look, see, I've got a job forever." I just... <laughs> You're turning into, <laughs> turning into Matthew Hopkins here. <laughs> or it just doesn't make much. It it, it just seems wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. Without evil, there's no need for a paladin, but. I mean, by that same logic, you know, men in the American army 
should be encouraging Al Qaeda because without them, you know, it, it you have a just job. doesn't seem to really track to me anyway. Uh, you Not can't with tell. the whole no, no. lawful good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Try. Yeah. Try and tell my grandfather it was good we had Nazis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's one of those. Now, if you were house ruling paladins, where they could be different alignments of good rather than simply lawful, you know, you might be able to make an argument for that with some other variant of paladin, but I don't think a lawful good paladin well, I, I would, would do it. That. A true neutral paladin could absolutely have the philosophy of, well, evil good, they balance out. Yeah, you get that whole druid thing going on. Well, if you look at it as a paladin, as a, as, a, uh, as a champion of a god and not necessarily a champion of lawful good, yeah. Right, exactly. Um... um. Yeah, I mean, so I don't know. Um, can, if you had if you had a storyline going, and this works a lot better in novels than it does in actual gameplay, but if you had a storyline going where you had a universe-destroying level of evil that the paladin needed to quest and an evil character was also trying to to further this goal to save the world you you might be able to have a paladin you know gritting his or her teeth and saying okay i'm working with this person for this greater good right now but as soon as this is over and done with all bets are off yeah temporary alliance oh yeah, yeah the old right, the unholy okay. alliance I want you actually time. have an old uh, you actually have an old uh, dungeon magazine module written by uh, Carl Sargent, actually. Um, it, it concerns champions of uh, order or law teaming up against champions of chaos. And I think one mm. of the player, one of the one of the aspects of conflict there is you do have a lawful good paladin having to team up with other lawful evil creatures to defeat, defeat the uh, chaotic creatures. Okay. I've read it's... it a long time, but I remember that that's a pretty interesting plot point there. <clears throat> which, is. Pl- which plays off the Moorcock idea of law and chaos as opposed to good and evil. Yeah. I, I need cut, to have a yeah. curmudgeon moment. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, I'm the, I'm I'm all about you're not playing it wrong if you're having fun at your game run it the way you want to. But in this right. case, absolutely not, because this is in effect trying to game the system. I mean, paladins, as written, get a lot of bennies in exchange for certain <clears throat> behavioral protocols. So you know, you can't have one without the other without starting to break and unbalance the game. Yeah. Well, Jim, Jim, isn't this the old, hey, take the paladin down the hallway, and we're going to take the guy in the room, and, and why don't you distract the paladin while we torture him to death? And you know, and then he's going to walk back 10 minutes later, and we're going to say, oh, he died accidentally. And, uh, that was an old – that was one that – Oh, yeah. I, I can't time. count the number of times yeah. that's happened. Yeah, what, why is he all – why, why does he have these stab wounds? Well, a death of a thousand cuts. <laughs> he fell down. Paper cuts. Paper See, cuts. That, that, yeah. that would be fine, Mike, because that's actually role-playing and, and strategy. That's not trying to game the system. But it's also assuming the paladin's so stupid that he's going to walk down the hallway while they show him the flowers down the hall and then walk back and the guy's dead. And he's going to say, oh, OK, we just accidentally died. Oh, and we know all the, all the information we need to know. <laughs> hey, Liz. Yeah. Look at the flowers. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Ow. Walking dead. Look at the flowers. Just look at the Lizzie, flowers. Lizzie, look at the flowers. No. <laughs> anyway, not a paladin, by the way. No. Well, how about the other comment about uh, torturing for information or allowing others to do it? That's kind of how I read it. Mm, yeah, I, I I would have to disagree with that one on any level. Well, we did this in a game we played where we were – we had a uh, – Mike was a fighter, Liz, you were an elf, I was a cleric, and uh, I, I was forget. a fighter. There was a fourth character, and we were all lawful, and then we had the neutral thief, and we didn't want to drag goblin prisoners around the dungeon, so the four lawful characters went to the next room to let the thief, who the goblins had just ate his friends, you know, <laughs> deal with the goblins. But none of us were paladins. Yeah, right. none of us were paladins. Yeah, and even so, my dwarf was, as we've said on earlier podcasts, was conflicted about the whole thing. Um, it's a gray area. I can see in an extreme circumstance 
like there's information vital to saving the kingdom in X amount of time that a paladin might be willing to let that happen. But it would have to be very extreme and rare. Right on. And would it be something that was so dire that the paladin would basically be saying, I realize that I could lose my paladin, you know, but this is so important. I'm willing to make that sacrifice. The greater good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That'd actually be a heck of a role playing right there. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I love you, Liz. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, hey, my wife. Platonically. (laughs) Mike, I'd be more worried if you said he loved you. (laughs) You'd be more worried. I'd be more worried. (laughs) He's kind of hot. He's kind of hot in those shades, man. Mm. Yeah. I think so. Uh, Anyway. I heard Jim say something about a nice tush on you, too. Uh, Whoa. Yeah, I keep it on my on my desk in formaldehyde. Anyway, <laughs> next email. Next email. Thanks Please. for that, Kevin. <laughs> Thanks for that image, Kevin. <laughs> All righty. Our next email is from Alistair. And Alistair writes, hi there. I was, in, I was introduced to your wonderful podcast when I was scouring iTunes for anything related to swords and wizardry. Ah. I really love the background music to the Products of Your Imagination segment and would like to know, if possible, where is it from? Keep up the great work. Alistair. Thanks, Alistair. Over to Glenn. Okay. Alistair, I do not know the name of that tune, but, and mainly because, like, I don't have it anymore because my hard drive crashed, but you will find it and a lot more License free, copyright free, Creative Commons Kevin, music from Kevin McLeod, Kevin McLeod, Kevin McLeod at Incompetech, www.incompetech.com. It is there. Um, like you I don't said, remember I, the name. I don't remember the name of the piece, but he, um, all all his music is there. You just have to sort through it and find it. Okay. Uh, and it's and it's copyright free, so anybody could use it. That's why I use it in all these shows. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> That's sorry. Nice. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> sorry, Alistair. Like uh, arranging to have um, Janelle Jakeways on the show. You know, Glenn handled it. So, <laughs> but you know where to start. <laughs> it's a quest. Yep. Yes, for first to third level characters. Well, at, le- <laughs> at least it's just it's, at least it's just one website. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. Yes. And if anyone else knows the name of it, write in, and we can tell Alistair that way. That's or right. Something. <laughs> All right. Any more emails? Okay. Our last email is from David Lynch. Oh, Mr. Lynch. I, yeah, that was one of my favorite movies, so I can't wait to hear what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dave. Hi, Saber Die. This is David Lynch. No, the other one. <laughs> oh, oh, I, oh, sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> super Dave on the OSR forums. He's, re- he's really Super Dave? Cool. Super Dave. Super Dave. <laughs> yeah. The guy super Dave Osborne. Oh, super Dave Osborne? <laughs> Lynch, yes. No, not that Super Dave. The other one. The other one. <laughs> <laughs> the other, yeah. other guy. Oh, John, a lot of celebrities listening to your show. I'm really bummed out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're one. So. Thanks for responding to my previous email about Realms of Aden. The best campaigns I've ever run started with just a few notes, and then my players' suppositions and assumptions built the details from there. I wanted to respond to one of the Basic Impressions dialogues, in which T-Man talked about how he used saving throws because he had experienced some confusion about them. I look at them as a priority system to help me on the fly. The order is specific. Death ray slash poison. Pretty straightforward and simple. You are resisting an effect meant to kill you outright. Simply doing sufficient damage to kill you doesn't count, or else everything would be a death save. (laughs) Magic wands. You are avoiding an effect fired at you from a discernible source. If it's a death ray fired from a wand, the save versus death takes priority. Paralysis slash petrification. You are resisting some kind of traumatic body-changing effect, also used for most gaze attacks. A wand of paralysis is treated as a save versus wands. Dragon breath. 
Avoiding an area effect, this could also substitute for most non-targeting trap effects, like the obligatory gas cloud. Spells. Any spell effect that does not fit into one of the above categories. So, any save applicable effect follows the order and drops into the first save for which it qualifies. And as you can see, save or die takes priority over everything, yeah. thereby Woo-hoo. confirming your status as the best classic podcast ever. Oh, Thanks ah, for ah, listening, ah. Super Dave. <laughs> Thank you, Super Dave. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> okay, but I do have a little, a little quibble about the death ray poison save. Uh, if I'm understanding this correctly, it's something to kill you outright, not, as he says, not doing sufficient damage to kill you or doesn't. Because I've seen so many, I've seen a lot of poisons down there like save versus death rate poison for half. Right. It's like, that's kind of counterintuitive. But basically, save. you save or die, but even if you make the save, you take like half damage? Or do you mean right. a plain just damage poison that then. Well, I, I've I've seen it both ways though. I've seen yeah. you know you save or die. If you don't die, you get half damage or mm-hmm. save for half damage. Or, yeah. or you know, it just it. I'd love to have it work the way he describes it. That's what I'm saying. Ah, but there's a lot of things out there that don't work that way. I don't mm-hmm. know why. You know, modules and other things. I think so, what he said was pretty astute and brilliant. It was. It was. That's yeah. why I like it. It just. You know, that's I just wanted to bring that up as kind of a devil's advocate type of thing. Yeah, my only quibble would be about the breath weapon. I see that more as an evasion dexterity type saving throw than necessarily a gen, you know just an area effect kind of thing. Well, but, if you if you think about it, saves are if they do save, you tell them how they saved. That makes sense. Yeah. I'm just saying if you're going to objectively, you know, put an objective qualifier on what sort of scenarios, personally, me as a DM, I feel like breath weapons, something more like you're leaping out of the way kind of thing. Okay. But again, you're getting out of the area and Mm. by leaving the area, you have saved. Mm, True. True. So I think it still works. Well, it's not a perfect I, I, system because spells can do any of those things. Cone of Cold is your area effect. Disintegrate is your save or die. But uh, yeah. but I really like the way he categorized them as a sort of a general tool and way of thinking about them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, Breath of Wisdom was like save versus not being there to get hit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and spells is another way of saying other. <laughs> Miscellaneous. Right. Miscellaneous, yeah. Yeah. Save versus charm monster. What do you, what do you think, Bad Mike? Um, I think y'all covered it. That was great, guys. Thanks. No, actually, I was going to. I wanted to ask a question here, just out of curiosity. Uh, has anyone here ever played a game or thought of going to a game with with the one saving throw uh, mechanic that Swords and Wizardry has? I'd love to. Mm. Never have, but I'd love to. I, I have to say, this is going to sound so heretical, but the older I get, I'm thinking about moving to that system. I think it would be easier. So. Hell, I'm, bad, I'm, I, bad Mike, I'm halfway into Tunnels and Trolls, which has the saving role, which is a generic thing, which is the same thing. So I'm kind of in that camp too. I feel uh, you. If Mike. I was gonna, if I was gonna modify mine, would uh, I would take the C and C one, which basically just runs them as attribute checks. Right. I can't. That's what I. If I were gonna change it, that's what I'd do. Well, you could do. You had a have a base save number. But depending on what type of save, you know, have that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking at, Liz. Yeah, that's what have, and have your does. yeah have your attribute modifier for that particular type of save add into the base number. And also, instead of having classes that have their own saves, you have the base save number, and then they have modifiers depending on the class you take. So that could still give you some variety. You're not just yep. rolling. No matter what you're saving against, you're rolling a ten always. Is that because that doesn't right. seem to make that doesn't seem to make sense to me? But yeah, if you could do modifiers depending on the type of save, you know, your attribute, blah blah blah. Liz, you know, right. I, I think that could work. That's clear, concise, and well and, presented. And I'm wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I, I'm saying she's right. I I, ah. I refute your refutation, good sir. Mike, you ignorant, Mike, you ignorant slut. Bah. 
Well, I'm, I'm kind of in with uh, Bad Mike. I mean, as I get older, I get less tolerant for crunchy rules. And uh, of all things, you know, what I like using now is the the three saves, you know, Fort Will and Reflex. Yeah. <gasps> no, I can't go there. Sorry. I know. I know. <laughs> Those wishing to replace Jim Lumpler on the show can fight <laughs> SaverDiePodcast at gmail.com. Well, see, that's hey, what's beautiful about DCC RPG is, you, is, uh, is you get your cake and world, eat it, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that's that's true. Uh, DCC plug. Wow, interesting. And, yeah, they, <laughs> Most unexpected. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I love modifiers. I mean, if I if I got a you know, versus a like a a number you have to hit, you know, target number you have to hit versus modifiers, I'll take modifiers every time. So yeah, I'm in that camp. Bah, you're all um, wrong. <laughs> But for those wanting to write to tell me if I'm wrong, you can write at saverdiepodcast at gmail.com. Or call in to 940-536-3763. We, we haven't had any, any voicemails in a long time. Well, we, we do have a voice. We do have at least one voicemail that we need to do. Oh, do we, we? Yes, we do. Maybe we can I, do that in the next episode. We will. Well, next show is going to be a... An email shows, so we can wow. we're all, still all behind. <laughs> we're at maybe least we'll that, make we're... it to maybe we'll make it to the end of March. Maybe yeah. <laughs> I personally, yeah. I think we'll be lucky to make it to the end of February. But you so know, does this, does this mean the 2014 North Texas recap show will be like six months right before the next one? <sighs> right before 2015, yeah, <laughs> yeah, just in time for the next one. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're keeping up interest. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And now a word about North Texas RPG Con. The North Texas RPG Con. Shoot, a fella could have a pretty good weekend in Vegas with all that stuff. Uh, well, I don't really know what to say, except that uh, this year we'll have our sixth annual convention. Uh, it's going to be Thursday, June 5th, uh, until Sunday, June 8th. Um, the convention, you, you probably heard uh, Mike and Liz and the gang talk about it. It um, concentrates mostly on old school games, pre-2000 RPGs. And um, if you're in the area, or even if you're not in the area, we'd love to see you there. Uh, we have a, an incredible lineup of old school guests. Uh, including but not limited to Frank Menser, Tim Kask, uh, Janelle Jaquez, um, oh, there's just too many to mention. And, and also, uh, as an added attraction, everybody on the show will be there. So if you want to see the Saber mm-hmm. Dive, they'll all be there. Um, and uh, I don't know. That's about all I wanted to, wanted to say there. Um, we Prizes? don't just have – uh, prizes we have oh prizes no, prices oh prices um, price to attend oh I thought it was free it's not free oh it isn't free <laughs> it's free to you yeah oh, <laughs> oh I never I haven't paid all these years so I thought that's a great deal still um, this, yeah, so I can save a little no, money if you uh, register actually if you uh, best thing to do is register now because you register early now first of all we have a deal in the hotel rooms at the Marriott we have it at the beautiful DFW Marriott South south of DFW Airport five minutes away um, the rooms are. Uh, Hundred dollars a night, which is a special rate. Marriott is that's a really good rate for Marriott, if you know that. But that rate is only till the end of uh, April. Uh, we also have registration right now. It's it's fifty dollars for all three days. However, uh, that registration is only till um, the end of April. Also, uh, starting May May first, the registration becomes sixty dollars for the that's whole weekend. That's at the weekend. door too, right? Yeah. Yes, and at the door. Um, so the best thing to do is get your reservation for the hotel and the reservation for the convention now. I got to talk to the hotel because they're charging me 107 a night. Yeah, it's 100. Well, it's 107. I'm sorry, I said 100, but it's okay. 107. Okay, okay, thank you. Now it was 105 last year, and they jacked the price up horrifically, uh, two dollars. Oh, uh, fiends. Uh, yes, uh, but it's, it's just still a, it's a great deal. It's a really a great deal. And, it is. Um, like I said, the best thing to do is to get get in now because. Uh, there is a little known fact here also. Um, at a certain point, we're going to limit uh, registration because the hotel we're at uh, can only handle a certain number of attendees. Now, we shouldn't have that problem this year, but in right. the future, that is something we're probably going to have to look at just for basically fire code purposes. Well, you just set up uh, tents on the parking lot. Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, how much is a day pass? Uh, a day pass is. Uh, I, I mean, I'm looking here as I say this because I don't even know what, how much we cost. I just, I just let people in. You know, I don't really. Know. <laughs> so um, see bad Mike. Doug, Doug, you didn't hear that, right? <laughs> yes. Don't don't tell Doug that. No. No, if you catch me catch me alone, it's a five spot. No, um, <laughs> no it, it's a one days are are twenty dollars. I think it's twenty five on the weekends. Oh, I'm sorry, the weekends are actually thirty dollars for Saturday. Uh, the other days are twenty five dollars. Okay. And if you want to meet the entire Save or Die crew there, and you're inside, just look for the hill giant. That will be Glenn. Look down. The other three of us will be right there. Or if you're outside, look at the smokers, and I'll be there, and I can take you into <laughs> the other three. He'll be the little people. <laughs> and and uh, and Crown Royal Man will be in attendance handing out free bags. So well, I'd like to throw, throw out a couple more things, too, um, um, as, I, as I slowly remember them. Um, uh, it's not just an RPG convention. We also do have uh, some board games. Where we concentrate mostly on RPGs because we noticed that a lot of conventions have moved away from RPGs. So we tried to say, look, we're going to do RPGs first, second, and third, and then anything else is, is afterwards. So right. you can play board games on open tables, but we don't necessarily schedule them. Or tactical how, games. How, however, we do have um, an annual gladiator combat we run and an annual uh, chariot racing combat uh, uh, game that we run. And uh, there's some um, board don't games forget, here and there. Don't forget the Aliens game. There's a, oh, uh, uh, Alan, Alan Grow, Grow Dog, brings his gigantic, beautiful alien set up there. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's just great just to, just to look at, even if you don't play the game. Dude, at Gary Con, I watched Luke run a bunch of guys, and they took out the queen. Bang, bang, bang. That's crazy. Was- I don't think that had ever happened before. I think I was talking to Alan. That's like a – had never happened, so um, – we actually have we have BattleTech this year too, run by Mike Stewart. Do we? Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. We do have BattleTech run by Mike Stewart. We we have a codicil in our um, game. Usually, when people propose games, we tell them that we only accept old school RPGs. However, if you are an original member of Anti RPG Con, you are allowed to run whatever you like for as long as you like. So as long as Mike Stewart and Liz Stewart and keep attending they can run bunnies and burrows or checkers or whichever game they want to so mike uh, chose the last couple of years to run a battle tech game which is very popular it may it may be full is there still any spaces available in that game last i checked there was one left and, and there is a prize for the tournament um although even though it is battle tech box set there is some role-playing elements and decision makings that will be have to be done and unfortunately, uh, full on gamer from Thacos, Thacos, Thacos Hammer, whatever, is not going to be here this year because he will be in the field, unfortunately. So, oh man, this year we'll, uh, another thing. Uh, this year we'll also have an artist alley, which we've had we've had artists before, but uh, this year we we decided to beef that up quite a bit. We're going to have a uh, area with just some tables there, and the artist alley will consist of uh, Jason Braun, uh, Doug Kovacs, DCC. Um, Jeff Easley, uh, Errol Otis. Uh, I don't do not think Janelle will be there, but for the first year, we will have Darlene. Ooh, I know Liz. Squee. Liz, you signed up for Darlene's game, didn't you? I did. We I have ha- a set. Yes, we actually own um, a set of the of the Jasmine. card. Yeah, the Jasmine card game. So I'm really looking forward to playing with her. Now you said Janelle's not going to be in the artist salary, but she will be there. She, oh, she's going to be there. Yeah. She'll be all over the convention. Yeah, she's going to be at the convention. But uh, she's, but she's, yeah, we, 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 our, oh, I'm sorry, I I can't believe this. I left Diesel out too, Lloyd right? Metcalf. Yeah, Diesel will be there too, and Lloyd Metcalf. Lloyd's going to kill me for that. Uh, <laughs> Lloyd will be there also. But yeah, we'll have a proper artist salary this time. This will be the first year cool. we've ever done this. We had just one section with all the artists, and they'll be sketching and drawing, and you know, uh, any comments or questions about what they're doing. Um, that's the place to go, and so. Cool. Uh, that's something we're, we're really excited about. We wanted we wanted to beef that up quite Will a bit. You draw there. a picture of my character for two dollars. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, Glenn and I love to meet actual artists. <laughs> hey, you are all real artists. I'm well, not. I but exist, that's a- but that's about it. And this year we'll also this will be uh we'll have the auction again this year we'll have the award ceremony we'll give away the three casts award uh, we'll have the we'll have raffle giveaway. And for the first year, I'm doing something kind of gonzo and weird. We're actually going to have uh, the midnight auctions, which are going to happen midnight Saturday. 
And all I can tell you right now is I'm going to be the master of ceremonies. It's going to be very bizarre. This is so, so <laughs> at midnight, so, I imagine so. Midnight on Saturday when everybody's beaten to a pulp and uh. probably been drinking for the last six hours and had their characters killed 80 or 30 times, I'm going to come out there and try to jade well, you. And throw I, some I will, I'll be there if my players don't beat me up too much in this game. In this game. <laughs> So, all right. Oh, well, and, it sounds uh, like it's going to be fun. We look forward to going. Yeah. And if you're going, folks, sign up for the Minds of Valhum on Friday night, please. <laughs> Sorry, had to get that. that. Blatant plug. Yeah, yeah. Matt Odinist is running it, and my game filled up. Most of them filled up within like the first ten minutes. He's still got six out of eight seats open, and I've been plugging him all over the. When place. is his show? When is his game going to be run? Friday. Friday morning. Ah, that's probably the problem. <laughs> well, definitely Mike Morning. and Liz will be there, yeah. Mike and Liz will not be there. So. <laughs> yeah, if it yeah. starts before 10 a.m., we're not there. <laughs> I'd, I'd play, but one, I played it before, and two, I'm playing in Janelle's Tunnels and Trolls game, so. Yeah. Now, I would yeah. like to plug a little bit. Uh, Glenn's game filled up really quickly. He was one of the fastest games to fill up, and I don't know if that's a comment more on how good a DM Glenn is or just because people like the game he's running, but... Uh, I was kind of surprised to see that. That's great. Name cool. recognition. That's all. I'm. I'm just. I'm just skating on my name. That's all. But uh, thank you very I, much. I do think a lot of people are excited to see a rule cyclopedia game make the game grid. So. But the way I wrote it. No. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> no, no. It's, no. It should. It should be. It should be a lot of fun. A lot. The castle of the howling dead. It's going to be fun. We are going to, and we're going to have other. Uh, obviously, we'll have a lot of uh, what I guess Dead Game Society usually their territory. Oh yeah, they're coming too, aren't they? I, th I think they'll be there. I don't think they're running games though. Um, we'll have uh, actually uh, a couple other things. First year, this is the first year that uh, Troll Lord Games will be there. Castles Crusades will be right at the convention, so uh -huh. we're very excited about that. They've been wanting to come since year two, and it's just never worked out. So they'll be here uh, actually running Castles Crusades games. We're going to have Gamma World. Metamorphosis Alpha, Tunnels and Trolls, uh, tra Traveler, Traveler um, just pretty much anything, any kind of old school game. And we have, we'll actually have some new games. We're actually going to have a D&D &D Next game run by a uh, veteran uh, game, uh, game designer, Steve Marsh. So that nice. should be interesting. Mm. Um, so, so we're not all old school games, but that is the focus of our uh, convention. Okay. And I've been bugging, I've been harassing Goblinoid Games saying, why aren't you ever at this convention? Where's your booth? Well, Dan, uh, Dan, I have to send out a couple of kudos to Dan. He always sends product to give away. He's, he's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, I, I run Labyrinth. Uh, I run a BX game, and I actually – it's BX slash Labyrinth Lord, and uh, he's been a huge supporter of the convention. He just hasn't been able to make it out there yet. Yeah. But he's, he's been really good about sending donations every year because uh, some people might not know. We, we really don't make any, and so we appreciate donations, and Dan's been really good about giving donations That's every cool. year. That's cool. I remember uh, twenty. I remember the okay. 2011 convention. I was running around going, anybody, Labyrinth Lord, I want to buy. I got money. Look. Labyrinth Lord, anybody? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's cut to a break and then return to look over Whisper and Venom. Welcome to Spellburn podcast about the Dungeon Crawl Classics role-playing game and old-school adventuring with Judge Job, Judge Jeffrey, and Judge Jim. Come join the band at Spellburn.com or wherever fine iTunes are sold. Whisper and Venom from Yay. Lesser Known Publications. A interesting, it's more of a mini campaign setting, I thought. Yep. Um, it's been published in a variety of ways. The box set was the um, Kickstarter one, wasn't it? Yes, it right. was. Yes. yes. 
Yeah. It had lots of goodies in it. So we're going to talk – when we talk about it, the data is essentially the same, but we're going to talk about the box set – uh, Kickstarter product, as well as maybe a few comments on the <clears throat> back reprint. But yeah. uh, first impressions, real general. Leave the format for you know products, but well, just right. first and foremost, I'm I'm glad we're finally reviewing something without the author physically present on the podcast because I find that a little limiting, and I've got a major gripe about this product. Oh, you do? Yes, I do. Ooh. I mean mm. the the. When you open up that box set, the artisanal quality and the amount of stuff you get is just like crazy for the price he sells it for. So he can't be making any money, which means he's going to go out of business soon. And he sets the bar <laughs> so high for these things that everybody else is just going to look at it and not want to publish anything ever again. So, <laughs> Yeah, I felt like the box set was almost, you know, all you need is a book of rules and you've got everything you need to run a game there. You got dice, yeah. you got minis, you got the That's monster right. cards, the maps and the Yeah, the module that. and I mean, wow. I mean, I the, only, like the only it. thing I've seen that even touches this is a, uh, amazing sorcerers and swordsmen of Hyperborea for, for box set That's product, product That's quality. Well, mhm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I love the way he he managed to repackage it too, into like a hardbound book. Or if you don't want the hardbound book, he's got a D and D a D and D type module version of it, with all the same information in there. Was it like WV one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, W WV one. Yeah. Or use so with classic fantasy role playing games. Yeah. yeah. It is generically set for classic games, but um, it's got a real classic feel to it. It does. Um, slash Labyrinth Lord, I suppose. Right. All right. It's hard for me to be objective about this because I've, I've known Zach just to right before he came out with this and back to when he first came to the NTRPG Con a couple of years ago and, and said something like, hey, I've got a module. I'm like thinking, yeah, you schmuck has a module, you know. So. <laughs> But uh, I just am so impressed by this, um, and the comment you made about not making money, from what I understand, I, I don't think that Zach made any money off this because he wanted to make this the best he could. I was trying and to be funny. I wasn't serious. <laughs> <laughs> um, which makes it all the more impressive, really. And we didn't even mention the T-shirts we got. You got T-shirts? Yeah. Well, not with this particular. No, the er, last year, the, the lesser known T-shirts. You got right. T-shirts. Yes. Yeah. I didn't get no T-shirt. I think he said he couldn't get one large enough for you, Glenn, because you're like a giant and okay, yeah, size. They didn't size go into your, XL, yeah. 10, ten XL. That's <laughs> don't make too many of those. I may, I wear a three X to four X. Come on, <laughs> I don't need Omar the tent maker for these. <laughs> Well, since we're at the top of the show, in the interest of full disclosure, I do need to announce up front that uh, I, do, I do Zach's website for him, and therefore I have an acknowledgement in the back of the rules for being cool in general. Yeah, I noticed that. That's why I keep getting kicked <laughs> off the website. Okay. So does Mike Badalato. Yeah, but I'd say Zach is smart. He put everybody's name in here that he ever shook hands with in his life in the back. So uh, he's he must covered have all, all his bases. Oh, no. That's but, not did, good. but I think he did put – didn't he put a shout-out to Save or Die in here somewhere? Hmm, I didn't see one. Second okay. edition. I can't believe he didn't. He missed somebody here. <laughs> yeah. Else. yeah. Anyway, All right. Well, I, let's I, do our top five then, and we will start with Bad Mike. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. What's now, what's the top? Now, what's the top no. five here? The top five count is you what? I'm sorry. We do we do a countdown like a top ten? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You you choose. Five things that stood out to you about it. We'll go everybody's number five, then number four, then number ah, okay. in a round robin. Oh, boy. this It's so hard to pick the one because I like so many things about this. I'm First of all, I'm going to say my five is just the fact that it's a box set, and it's a good box set. It's not a box set that, that didn't need to be a box set. This has so much stuff in it, as Jim said, that uh, it needed to be a box set. So I, that's one of my top five is the fact that it's just a cool box set that you can stick on your – uh, shelf and look at and say, wow, that that's full of great stuff. Mm. Okay. Liz? Okay, my number five is, as will probably sur surprise no one, Rumor Table. I'm <laughs> all, about, all about Rumor Tables. Um, and there's a really good 
rumor table in here. Um, yeah, like D20. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can hear as you're going through the, the setting. So yes, rumor table, very well done rumor table. Buy it because it has a rumor table. You will be glad you did. That's right. Okay. Mine, I would say, is I was very impressed about how he put what amounts to all the monster's stats, full stat write-ups, in the back in one of the appendices. Mm -hmm. So if there's any monsters, and there are a few new ones or a few, a couple from Swords and Wizardry, depending on what rule set you're playing with, if you don't have a that monster in your particular rule set, he provides them already in the back. I find that more. I find that more and more third-party people are cross-pollinating like that. Yeah, well, it's a good idea. And it's really nice. And speaking of that, Glenn, what's your five? Um, Kick-ass goblins. <laughs> um, these are like goblins plus, and they're all and they're all drug addicts. <laughs> <laughs> that that elixir they drink that makes them better than goblins also like puts a monkey on their back which i think is hilarious think about it won't you <laughs> <laughs> this is your goblin this is your goblin on drugs yes. any questions yeah that is okay pretty good. yeah that's what i like jim i'm gonna go straight to the lloyd metcalf art uh and I was oh, talking to Lloyd so. and Gary Khan about this, and Lloyd is too young to be very familiar with Jack Kirby. You guys know who Jack Kirby is, right? Oh, heck oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the analogy I was trying to convey to uh, Lloyd about his art is, I mean, generations of comic book artists have been inspired by and tried to emulate Jack Kirby, but they typically just imitate the, the surface cartouches of his style and the idiosyncratic things like the Kirby Crackle. And then you get a guy like Mike Mignola, who does Hellboy, and he metabolized Kirby and then did it in his own hand. What Lloyd has done with this art in this product is, I mean, he's looked at the, the early Dave Sutherland and the early Diesel and then done it his own way. And for a specific example, that uh, Merc Beast bursting out of the fountain that's on page 36. I mean, that's uh -huh. just, you look at that and suddenly it's 1979 again. But you don't you don't think Dave Sutherland – it's not like he copied Dave Sutherland's oh, yeah. style or anything. It's pure Lloyd Metcalf, but it's just – I mean really, really nice. Well, I look at that picture and think um, lobster tonight. Well, you know what I mean? I mean there's, there's a lot of us out there trying to do so-called oh, yeah. old-school art. Right. Lloyd, Lloyd nailed it. Yeah. And he does most of the interior art, doesn't he? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yes, he does. Frankly, all of it. <laughs> Number four. Uh, my, Bad my number four. My number four. I'm going to play off something you said, Mike, about the monsters. Is, um, I, and I'm not usually a big a big guy for this, but I love the monster cards and, because most people don't do them the right way. These were done perfectly. Um, they're all the monsters he has in the module. Not just the monster cards. The fact the monsters were perfect for this product. They aren't over the top. Uh, they really aren't that much different than than regular type monsters but they always have a little quirk or a little little change that make them just a little different i, I really really like the monsters and the monster card i'm a big monster fan anyway so mm -hmm. cool okay liz okay my number four there is an image inside the book it is for <clears throat> temple encounter number eight and it is an obvious tip of the hat to the cover of the little brown book Eldritch Wizardry supplement. Oh yeah. And the woman I, on the altar? Yeah, the the woman on the altar. Oh, I didn't even get that when I saw and, it. And I saw that and I just thought that was, you know, such a cool thing to add in there. You know, it's obviously not the same, but you can see the the similarities mm. and it makes you think of the Eldritch Wizardry book if you have it or have seen it. So mm. I, I thought that was really cool and a nice little add-in for some of us older people. <laughs> <laughs> All of us. Older. <laughs> okay. Well, my fourth is I liked his naming paradigm for the Whisper Veil. <laughs> um, all the names. I mean, I know when you're dealing with fantasy worlds, you've got certain names you do, but I like it when they do with stuff called like the meandering river 
the cleft, you know, dwarven mind. No, you know, the 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 falls of Oogle Boogly Doob or, you know, Lamanarda. I hate those kind of things because I always forget them and they always run together. But you know, actual descriptive names. Uh the goblin village of Swindle. You know. <laughs> That was pretty cool. <laughs> you're, you're get, you, write what's on the tin. It's there. You know, you know what you're getting here. And I like that. It, it, to me, it sticks in the mind better. I'm right there with you. Oh, I like it. I like that too, Mike. That's a great idea. Okay. Uh, for, for Glenn. Well, um, now I'm looking at the crit. I'm going off the hardback that we got because uh, Matt has my box set. Because he was drooling so much, I had to let him look at it, and he's painting the minis. So, but um, well, hurt. oh yeah. Uh, now, did Lloyd do um, all of the artwork in the inside, including the maps? No, no, maps were Alyssa Faden, and some of the art is Jeff D. Well, I know, like the covers Jeff D. and stuff, but I'm looking like the Whisper Veil vale map. You know, the area maps. That's what I'm talking Those are about all here. The uh, Majesty of Alyssa Faden. Alyssa, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just, I'm. I'm my jaw drops every time I look at him. It's like it's like I'm in a helicopter way up high looking down on this stuff. It's just incredible. Clouds and everything. It looks so real okay. that it just I'm taken aback every time. She does fantastic work. A wyvern's eye view, as it were. Yes, my God. Okay. I'm cool. flying. <laughs> She'll appreciate your worship. Yes. Jim? <laughs> We always step on each other, and that was my number two. So that didn't take long. Thanks, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was considering well, talking you... about the maps. Too, so I'm going to pay it forward and steal. To. I'm going to pay it forward and steal one before Liz gets to it. My number four is the <laughs> limited background art on the text pages. Ah, you know, yes. So, <laughs> did I get one of yours? <laughs> no, but I certainly thought about it. I was going to cover it when we talked about the the layout and the. You know the content format. You know, thank goodness it doesn't have a freaking tower in the middle of the page. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we all know the style now, nowadays of having some, you know, fully rendered Photoshop noise behind all the text that's mm -hmm. tiny uh -huh. and brown and hard to see. This is black type on white pages, and uh, when they designed it, they just took one color. And remember, when we were doing the gazetteer, and we're all annoyed about that uh, big uh, icon that's in the middle of every page. Uh -huh. and, right. and we suspected maybe they had just decided to print it in two colors, and what are we going to do with the second color? In this <laughs> case, it's just a little light blue, you know, faux page edging edge that doesn't overlap any of the type that has to float in front of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's great. Nice, yeah. big, crisp type, type and a clear layout, very easy to read, and my old eyes love that. Thank you. Number three. My number three is um, I love the setting of the – adventure and because i'm a huge sucker for a village in the middle of nowhere and you have limited options and there's just this big wild wilderness area all surrounding you with ruins and creatures and caves and stuff that that's probably my favorite setting of all time and i think uh zach does a great job in describing the village um and then the whole veil and all the different encounters you can run into there that's that's just a that's just my sweet spot for modules Cool. Yeah, I liked how he managed to bring in the idea of the plague in the valley to explain why there's so much, you know, ruins around. Right. Um, and, and also to kind of wall it off as a sandbox. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, very much sandbox vibe there, too. Yes, definitely. All right. Liz. Okay. Um, something that kind of stood out to me, as we've mentioned before, you've got the box set, you've got the the hardback version, which is also available, and you've got the module, which has this pretty much, it's the same adventure that is in the softback or hardback, you know, supplement booklet. Um, however, that being said, you know, I was flipping through the module, and it's not exactly the same. For all intents and purposes, it's pretty much the same adventure, but there's a couple of, you know, little tiny differences between the module version of the adventure and what you get in the supplement book. And mm. I don't necessarily find that a bad thing. I just found it kind of interesting. Um, 
for instance, the rumor table I was talking about on number five, in the module, it's a D12 table, whereas in the larger supplement book, it's a D20 rumor table. And then you've got another table uh, later on where, you know, things you can find. Um, yeah, items found searching exterior ruins. In the bigger supplement book, it basically just says cloth of indeterminate origin for number 12. But in the module, it specifically says it's a soiled loincloth. <laughs> Total available, unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> goblins so it's gotta be of, goblins. Yeah, you know, but it's it's just it's I just found it kind of interesting. You know, it's not exactly the same thing if you pick up one as opposed to the other. Nice. But as far as your end result, you know, the the really important big things, they're they're the same. You know, you're not going to have a totally different adventure if you get one over the other. It's not going to jeopardize play. No, no, no. Okay. All righty. Well, my number three would have to be the Whisper Village Temperance Society. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. You know, a bunch of old biddies running around trying to keep people from excessive drinking, which is really odd in a village where they do mostly brewing. <laughs> You know, yes. hey. Yes, but there's evil, evil brew. <laughs> the evil drink of the devil. Well, no, I like that because that means you don't have to wait for the players to start a brawl in the tavern. <laughs> One will start itself. <laughs> Very true. Very true. And, of course, what are the – well, never mind. I was going to say, what are PCs going to do? You know, take broadswords to – Old biddies who are trying to keep them from drinking, and then it's I, had I to know stop players going. who will. yes yes say, they would or at least some that, of it depends on the PC yeah, yeah. We'll just skip Kevin that one. Kevin Long's paladin will take a sword to him <laughs> <laughs> all right well Glenn well I like the feel of the adventure it's so unusual well no it just I feel like the John Cameron is following the party behind them filming aliens <laughs> because that's the feeling I got from it. It was from down <laughs> like, those catacombs down, yeah, the, down the caverns. The, yeah. And the, yeah. Down the caverns with this big mouth as a cave entrance and stuff. And it's like, okay, it's where's Ripley? Hunt. where? Yeah. Where's Ripley? Where? Okay. <laughs> all those weird lizard like creatures and the goblins were hopped up on meth and all that kind of crap. <laughs> Yeah, the the whole setting has a you know a dare I say a kind of a a a burgeoning corruption feel to all of it. You know, not just the monsters and the you know the the places where the demons are coming from, but you almost get a feeling of a sense of corruption that's trying to creep in on the edges of the small town and the townsfolk there. Right. And on, on a sense, they kind of realize that something bad is happening to their village, but they don't know what to do to stop it. And so they're almost just sort of, you know, going about their business helplessly. You know, I know something wrong is happening, but, I don't know what to do. You know? And and at the end of the, the venture where you go talk to Topus, it's like after he says what he says, it's like I see the end. Or is, is it? it? <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yeah, it could be played pretty dark. Mm -hmm. Glenn, to kind of yeah. back up what you just said, though, I like the way uh, uh, Zach wrote this where it's written with a very light touch where there's directive yes. uh, text in the adventure. It's like you may do this. Or change it lots of or change it to suit your campaigns, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's part of that nice feel. Yeah, none of that. Uh, you have to do things just like this, so the whole thing won't work, kind of stuff. Right. And and that's my number three. Okay, number three, Jim. Uh, I'm going to dive straight down into a magic item. I loved the quill of correspondence. Oh, I like that too. Which is, a, which is a magic quill that allows you on paper 
to theoretically write something out in any language. I mean, there's some little bonuses back and forth if it's a culture you're completely familiar with. But then the really cool part is, even if the creatures don't are illiterate and don't have a written language, you have a shot at writing phonetically and reading it aloud to them and getting off a of communication with them. That's wow. brilliant. Sort of babble fish. Yeah. <laughs> in a and a D and D cool. kind of way. Yeah. Only there's a re- there's a very real chance if you use that quill that certain things will get lost in translation Ooh. and you might wind up torquing off the person you're trying to communicate <laughs> with. <laughs> which which is you know what image I, I know, reminds I know me the, of the I know the French words to tell you you're a good egg, but if I tell you you're a good egg and translate that into French, nobody in France knows what I said. <laughs> or the Monty Python skin. I was just thinking oh, yeah. that the Hungarian, yes, my, the my Hungarian translation is book. My nipples, <laughs> my nipples is... explode with delight. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go back to my place, bouncy bouncy. Yeah. I am not infected. <laughs> I mean, all sorts of horrible things could happen with that magic item. <laughs> All righty. So now number two. My number two is uh, I enjoyed uh, the characterizations, characterizations of the villagers because they were very morally ambiguous. The whole village is not your father's village of Hamlet, uh, unless everybody in the village of Hamlet was Rannis Duval and Gr- Grimmie. Um, <laughs> there, it, it's everybody there has their quirks, but it, it, it reminds you of a more realistic medieval slash fantasy style village and that um everybody is not so good there there's drunks there's thieves there's kleptomaniacs there's perverts there's uh people who head on north to the go to the goblin town to get some uh, cheap rock gut whiskey every once in a while and mm-hmm. uh it's it's very interesting in that there's not necessarily a lot of heroes here it's kind of a old west town very morally ambiguous where you know um, you're not forced to act one way or the other because everybody there is, you know, pretty much a regular human being, if maybe a little worse than a regular human being. And I, I really enjoyed that. I, I like that aspect. Yeah, not to give away spoilers, but the ending, the the villagers' reactions after things have changed is is a yeah. perfect example of that. Right. Um, That's part of the or is yes. it type thing. Yeah, I don't want to say what happens, but yeah, there's you, there's certain ways certain things can happen that are yeah. It, it doesn't end right with, with happy. I, I don't know if I don't know if that would. I don't know if you have, you know, certain players would that are kind of kind of rub them the wrong way. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, potentially. Well, again, that falls into the hole as a DM. You've got to really know your players. But, but speaking yeah. of a DM, I think a DM could have a lot of fun with this town rather than, well, here's the cobbler and he's this way and everybody's nice and friendly. It's kind of like, you know, the B2 of Keep of the Borderlands. Everybody's pretty much a good egg in there. Mayberry. You know? Yes, May. It's very Mayberry usually. This is not Mayberry at all. It's <laughs> it's, it's Mayberry if, uh, you know. No, this is if, Twin if, Peaks. If, yeah, I was yes, just yes, very that. much so. Yeah, I was it's, just thinking Twin Peaks. I mean, it's not, it's not to the quite to the level of a raggy, you know, village where you know the the guy oh. and the you know the the cobbler is uh you know also a, a cannibal and uh you know <laughs> yeah. no, no yeah, carcosa so, here yes no. it's not that bad but it but it does give you no something claim. to work with if you don't want to just have that that regular boring average vi- you know uh medieval village it's it, I, I really appreciated that part of it I, actually i reread it today to uh in anticipation of this review and i just was struck by how much how funny some of the descriptions are yeah. mm. uh, as was said too funny and a little okay. subversive Yes, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Liz, too. Well, mine is along the same veins as Bad Mike's. The personalities of the NPCs and of the monsters, the goblins, the pixies, they all have their own special spin to them, which makes them stand out from the "Quote unquote normal versions of them that you run into in other games and in other supplements. Zach really spent a lot of time making the setting and the creatures in the setting his own. Mm. You know, he didn't. You know, he didn't just give interesting backgrounds to the townsfolk, but the goblins you run into, the pixies, some of the other intelligent monsters and creatures." that you run into, they're all, you know, 
different from the the stock type that you would expect to find or interact with in an adventure. Even some of the goblins are meth heads, yeah. Yeah, like you know, it's yeah. it, it's really very innovative on so many levels and I just thought that was fantastic. So what? If you've written your own modules, you know how hard that is to do. It's it's hard to make anything because in your mind you have the stock goblin, the stock orc, the stock you mm -hmm. know whatever. It's actually kind of hard to think outside the box sometimes and not make it just a total over the top caricature. And yeah. I think you're right; he does a good job with that. The older you are, and the more you've written, the harder that gets. Yeah. All right. Well, my number two would have to be the Pixie Slaves yeah. in Swindle. <laughs> There you go, Mike. You stole one from me, so feel feel free. Ha-ha. <laughs> Ha-ha. I liked those. I, I got a bit of a Dresden Files vibe off it. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know if that was intentional or not. <laughs> that was kind of how I felt on that with Man. the dewdrop berries. You love your Dresden Files. I do. I have converted is, him. Which is really funny because she tried for years to get me to read that, and I wouldn't. And And she made me, and... Just goes to show. Listen to your wife. <laughs> Glenn? Uh, number two, right? Yep. Well, I'm I'm going off of partial information on this one because I don't have the box set with me. I don't ever remember seeing a map of the town proper other than that big old, you know, like pullback type thing. But what struck me was the town was partially populated, which I liked. You got the major players, things like that. I don't like these play. I mean, okay, fine. I like City State Invincible Overlord, but it can be overwhelming with every single thing stocked. Yeah, here you, you get feel kind of trapped. Here you get a village with the major players, and that's it. Okay, you can put I, in people as you need to. Yeah, that's right. If I want to stick the weird farmer on the hill in there, I can do that. You He's know a that bad kind of hermit. A man hermit in the cave. It is a balloon. Yes, yes, a balloon that you prick and magic comes out of it. And I'm sorry. Or going back to Twin Peaks, stick in the yes. log lady. Yes, <laughs> the log, let's stick the log lady in there. She was wrapped in plastic. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's my number two. Okay, Jim. Uh, my number two was uh, the Alyssa Faden map, so I'll just talk a little bit more about uh, Alyssa's work in general. I mean, I hired her uh, and worked with her when I was art director at Gagax Magazine. Her uh, work is in many other products besides Whisper and Venom. I mean, she is as good – she's that combination of good and super professional to work with. And I just love the way that – I mean, I like – different styles of maps so it's not like i'm hung up on just the way she does them but these lush fully painted maps that are like from you know an orb orbiting satellite where the clouds are casting shadows on the landscape it looks like like a, a, a lush rafi-esque google map google maps shot. yeah <laughs> yeah they're cool. just google Earth right gorgeous there, yeah. anybody anywhere who's going to put maps in their products should consider hiring Alyssa because she's fantastic. Yes. Uh, yes. I'd love to see her do a map of at least part of the Forgotten Realms. My, Just my... one part, if not the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number one, up to you, Mike. My number one is um, I love Topus. Uh, he, <laughs> and you step on, somebody. And somebody else, see, somebody yes. else steps on one too for me. He, he is so. the anti Elminster. Um, you could tell. That, <laughs> yeah. That's good. <laughs> Zach had a great time writing him, and and for what I've I've talked to Zach about his inspirations a lot. He was based on a player character that uh, Zach had that the guy played him pretty much exactly as he appears. Maybe not quite as uh, sleazy, but um, he's evil. He's a pervert. He's a sicko. He's a practical joker, but his practical jokes really aren't funny. Um, <laughs> he's pretty much has every vice you could imagine. And oh, and he's supposed to help the player characters. So. Uh, I, I he's just my first DM, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I just think he's a great creation. I, I, like I said, I reread it today, and just going over the parts with him. Uh, I mean, I want you want to kill him. You're like, when, I just want to put a sword to this guy because this guy's so freaking evil. But uh, you know, it, it just I think it adds a lot to make the the quote unquote main you know protagonist really a very unlikable and sleazy kind of individual but uh it really fits in the whole atmosphere of uh the whisper and venom box set and the the game world that uh zach is creating there no yeah. yoda here no 
Yeah, when I was reading over the NPC of Topus, the thing that first went into my head was he's like a smarmy, sleazy Professor Moriarty. Well, you know, Mike, <laughs> Mike, Mike, Good idea. Are Good you sure he's based on one of Zach's player characters? Because I thought, no, no, it, was, what I thought it was autobiographical. <laughs> <for that. laughs> it could be. I'll have to ask. Maybe he was just trying to hide that from me. But uh, yes. Okay. Liz? Okay. My number one is the Nexid Mouthgate. I just think that is a really cool idea. You know, this... Creepy. Yeah, is, you know, just appearing out of nowhere one night is this opening in a cliff face, which looks like a giant face with an open mouth, and it goes into what appears to be a cave system. And then, you know, in the explanation that it gives to it, you know... If one night, for no apparent reason, the eyes of the face open and begin to cry. And it's, it's just really creepy. And just, I, I love it. <laughs> and people ask why my player characters tend to have low wisdoms. Because it's player characters who see something like that and go, hey, let's go look in there. <laughs> you guys are absolutely right. This is a very David Lynch vibe in this thing, and, and, and not that guy who wrote us, the other one. <laughs> not Super the Dave. The other David Lynch. <laughs> but not the other David Lynch, the other, other David Lynch. That mouth, that mouth cave, I keep thinking of the, the Cave of Wonders from Aladdin. <laughs> With the giant tiger head. <sighs> yep. Yeah. All right. Well. My number one has to be, it's a bit mechanical, but I like the way he laid out the various encounter areas once you get into the monastery and parts beyond. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of box text, mm -hmm. but I will say his box text is just the base info. He doesn't go on for four paragraphs Purple of pros. what you're supposed to read to, party, <laughs> to the party and... And I like how he gives a summation of all the treasure at the end of the mm. entry. I love so that. Oh, for a quick that. reference, that's great. And I've got to put in a plug. I loved the plus two magical Volge Disarm. Because <laughs> what party members? Oh, yes, I use those. <laughs> <laughs> that was that's awesome. My, that's my favorite weapon right there. <laughs> my miniature has one. Yeah. <laughs> So that was great. That's my number one. Do I lose old school points for not even knowing what that is? <laughs> it's a pole arm. That's close enough. Okay, that's all I need. Jim, you're assigned a, a Gary Gygax's pole arm article. You have to read it eight times before tomorrow. And uh, please give us a report on that. Yes, sir. and give it and say three hail Garys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Glenn. Well, I'm looking now that uh, Bad Mike took my uh, topus. Uh, See, I've, I've gotten uh, to where I choose like a couple of extras. That way, if anybody chooses well, it. You know, Glenn, has, Glenn hasn't figured that out yet. Uh, well, he's only well, got 100 the, of these. So. Well, the thing is, when somebody chooses something of mine, I'm thinking, well, I've got something else to say about it. But then Mike like nailed every point I was going to make. Nailed okay. it. So I'm going <laughs> to <laughs> I'm going to take the number two in my favorite monsters, the Spiny Horror. It's go. a rat. It's a rat with a twist. <laughs> I want my want one of my player characters to have one as a pet and call it Norman. <laughs> Was so it I just me, or did I get? Did anyone get kind of a piercer feel off that? Yeah, kind of. It reminded me Spine. of yeah. the versions the thing and that John Carpenter movie went through when the head just dropped off and spider legs came out. Popped out and start running off. You gotta be freaking kidding! Yeah. <laughs> Don't effing believe this. <laughs> yes, it's like oh, a cute little rat. <laughs> Man, and they can the rat of Sumatra. There you go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, Jim. Um, this is gonna <clears throat> sound so stupid, but it means a lot to me personally. The box set came with dice. I just, yeah. yeah, you know. Yes. I started when I started. I got what I got in 1979, and here it is, 2014, and I get dice with my box set. Good dice. Yeah, really yeah. good dice. 
Good beautiful, dice. <laughs> beautiful red dice that I've lost somewhere around here when we moved. I mean, but, I, I still have my basic dice and my Gamma World dice and every other dice that came in box set. And even though they're all mixed up in my dice bag, I know which set each one came from. So I'm going to be looking at these and going, oh, there are my Whisper and Venom dice. Yeah. I, I love the dice that came with the home set. I do. But let's be honest. That is when I got some dice and didn't I was gonna have to say chips. you got chips. dice with your home set. Eventually, <laughs> eventually I, I didn't bought have one any with, the with dice. mine. <laughs> no, I eventually bought one with dice, but my first one no I had the chits. But let's be honest, they, I, I, the only good thing I'll say about them is their bright colors were easy to find, and those D fours <laughs> were sharp. <laughs> yeah. You could kill a man with that D4. Well, I mean, who didn't use that yellow D4 as their campfire? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's that bright yellow, lemon yellow. Yep, is... yep, yep. <sighs> All right. Well, hey, that's our top fives. So let's move along. Your dungeon master has placed you in a dreadfully precarious position. They're right next to you. Well, all you do is we play the characters we talked about earlier when we run around and stuff. I want to show you a trick Mother showed me when you weren't around. Use your lightning bolt. Victory is yours. I'm attacking the darkness. <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons game. Products of your imagination. You're not there. You're getting drunk. Where to potty again? Or potty. I, I thought we did that between between <laughs> segments. <laughs> I told you if you have to go, go now. <laughs> now we're doing it on the air. Oh, oh that's going to increase our latest listenership. <laughs> <laughs> now we got the perverts listening. Great. Now they save or die. But anyway. Oh. All righty. They save or diarrhea. Yeah. Uh, Tom, 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 tom. <laughs> right. The product. Yes. Art people, start talking. Yeah. Well, it's got art in it. <laughs> yeah. It's got pretty pictures. <laughs> no booger art in here. It, it does have some that lovely art, you know, and it's not all the same style either. You know, virtually all of the interior art is Lloyd Metcalf, and he did all kinds of different styles you know you've got some watercolor type washes going on in some you've got line art you've got you know paints and you know he, he's just run the gamut on different styles throughout Almost. the whole book it doesn't all look like the exact same kind of art over and over That's and right. over and over again so kudos to him for that and, and Alyssa Faden for the maps and the draftsmanship Mm-hmm. I mean, I and, have to, I'd have to ask Lloyd, but I'm I'm sure all this art went through the computer, but it looks like it all started out life as hand rendered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not digital. And let us not forget Big Jeff D doing the cover. And yes. the, and, and Jeff did the design for Topas, who's like the company symbol. And I, and I right. know uh, for a fact that Zach spent a little more on the cover because it was a Jeff D cover, but I think it was money well spent. It's oh, very yeah. eye catching, and it's it's very it's a great very, atoral uh, on there. It, yeah, it's really good. Now, does the uh, the single book versions of the of the setting have uh, the, the same, same cover? Art. The same cover. Even the, mo okay. the module version has the same art. Okay, excellent. Because if you're going to pay Jeff D his rate, you're going to use that stuff over and over. That's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, format. Yeah, format time. <laughs> Layout. Obviously, there's no picture behind the text. Yeah. Basic two column layout, which is good. Yeah, I'm, with, I'm with you, Mike. I love the layout. I, I was just really impressed. It, and I, I don't know why people don't do it like that. Why don't more people do it like that? Who got the idea that you want to have a bunch of dense text or um, drawings behind uh, words? It doesn't make yeah, any and sense. Then, and then what's the next thing you hear is art is so expensive. Well, but Liz, back me up on this because we're yeah. both also graphic designers. I mean mm -hmm. a, a, an out-of-control graphic designer likes to make things over-designed just because it's fun. Yeah, oh, oh, um, yes. when when I was doing work at a Yellow Pages company doing ads, one of my fellow designers was guilty of that very thing. All of the ads that they did were just 
crammed with overwork and it it was it was hard to read her stuff sometimes because there was just so much that she would make going on in every single ad that she created and yeah. i tended to prefer a cleaner style and so yeah it it does get you can fall into that trap where you're just having so much fun playing with photoshop that you just go out of control <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm that, was, that was very typical of uh, a lot of the first third edition products because you had a lot of people that had never published before and they had all these great computer programs they thought i'm just gonna throw everything in the kitchen sink at this thing yeah look at a lot of the early uh, third edition products that's exactly the problem it kind of reminds me of the early days of the internet with websites going up right. here and there mm-hmm. and they just have all this stuff and animation and colors and stuff and yeah. you just can't read let's it let's have some, and... some midi music files going yes. on in the background <laughs> that just makes you want to kill yourself and... we used to call that the geo cities effect you... oh, okay. oh, yes. <laughs> but this does not fall into those traps um mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's very very well done. You know, it's very subtle. It's very you know classy looking. You've got some great font choices that are easy to read, and you know the as Bad Mike mentioned, the text is not so densely packed that it's difficult to to read through. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think they hit the sweet spot with just the right amount, you know, a good balance of text and art. You don't have too much of either one or the other. I'm a big mm-hmm. believer in art directors and editors, whichever side of the fence I, I personally mm-hmm. happen to be on, because that's the, that's the answer to that. I mean, uh, Mike, do you know how to pronounce uh, John Hamerl's name? Uh, Hammerly, I think. Hammerly. Okay, so because John Hammerly co-wrote this with Zach, but he also edited yes. it, and I suppose Zach right. was the art director. So those, you know, those are and, important and think, jobs. Think about this is the first thing they did. This is the first thing Zach's ever done. He had to self-teach himself all this. Everybody oh. needs an editor, and everybody needs an art director. Unless you're Da Vinci or Shakespeare, we all need them. Uh, well, if you know, if just to Zach's... tell you when you went too far for exactly yeah. what we're talking yeah. about. Just okay, pull back a little. Come this way. Yeah. Well, if Zach self-taught himself, you know the you know, layout and everything. I he's I would say he has an innate eye for you know when and how to use you know white space and you know illustration. Yeah, it's it's very nicely done. Would any of you say that he might have intentionally been trying to uh, harken back to classic products? Oh, yeah. I would say, yeah, definitely, especially when in the module version, mm-hmm. because that looks just like an AD and D first edition or basic D&D in the day module. Well, you know what? Yeah. Okay. So from, the, less, from, the, from the lesser co- gnome on the, on the cover, the lesser gnome logo, yeah. they, they did a version to make it look like the old TSR logo with, with, with the little gnome face, you know, the and, little wizard in the yeah. square. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but with a, with a, a light touch, like Gygax magazine mm-hmm. looks exactly like dragon magazine used to. This isn't like that. This is done with a light touch. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So an but homage, I mean, uh, an but, homage without beating you over the head. With right. It. But but they got like the book that comes out. You know, the module they got the book that comes out, and you can lay the cover flat for the maps and all this stuff like they used to do. Okay. And the fonts the same and everything. Is the map in the module uh, on the inside cover blue? Uh, it is no. blue, yes. but it's not the sky blue. Not the non-repo no. blue. Yeah, <laughs> the non-photocopy blue. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a darker sort of blue, but you do okay. get the same feel, sort of, you know. Okay. So. All right. Well, hey, any Mike? other comments, or do we want to go to dragons then? Hey, Mike. Mm. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll ask after the dragons. Can I? Never. Bad, bad Mike or good Mike? You got to. It was it was yeah. bad Mike, but I'll ask oh. after the dragons. We're gonna. Okay. Um, I know we're going to put a link to Lesser Gnome in the show notes. Can I just run down the different versions this is available in and what they cost? Sure. sure. Okay. Uh, there's a retail box set that comes with most of what we talked about, and that's fifty nine bucks. There's a limit edition box set for seventy nine ninety nine, and that's what that's we what all we got get. when we backed the Kickstarter, which has got just like you know dice bags and miniatures and ridiculous levels of stuff in the box. The uh, hardback that we all got, I picked up at Gary Khan. Uh, normally it's thirty nine ninety nine, but it's on sale right now for twenty nine bucks, and the PDF is twelve ninety five. And then there's some crazy Whisper and Venom complete that's like 130 bucks. I guess if you want like the baseball cap and 
Zach's birth certificate. <laughs> Those psychotic ASM yeah. yeah. will be all over that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, it I'm must be mine. Well, I wanted all to add right. one more thing, too. I just throw something out. Mm. Uh, we didn't cover this in any of the uh, sections there, but I thought this is one of the best generic sets i've ever seen in terms of you could pick up any any old school rule set and immediately play the game um yeah. anything any old school a lot of the times when the, when people say it's generic it's not really that generic and i felt this just hit, absolutely hit the spot in terms of being generic enough you could run with any rule system yeah. you could buy this at a convention grab a rule book sit down and start playing you've got oh, everything yeah. you need yep. here you know i hadn't even thought about that my, bad mike but you're absolutely right i mean uh, Labyrinth Lord, AD and D, it wouldn't matter. No, yeah, it's, no, it's great. No. Which is one of, a slight gripe I have, but only a slight one. And I, I, I won't say I looked for gripes, but you know, I tend to be the hard ass here in the in the group. And my only gripe, and it's like I said, a mild one, is if you're playing with classic D and D or non Labyrinth Lord. Mm -hmm. Some of the spell lists will throw you off because there are some spells that didn't exist in classic. Like the withdrawal spell? Yeah. Um, and some things that are ADD, like Arcane Eye. Now, I understand he's doing, you know, OGL, et cetera. And right. any DM worth their salt can just, you know, substitute something else. And that is that is a very minor gripe, and I'm not even sure how you would get around that because if you're going to give a, a wizard spells, you've got to base it on some rule set. You sure. can't give them a, an alternate, you know, give like eight different <laughs> spell lists for eight different clone games. You just, <laughs> but yeah, um, fortunately with everything else with the monsters and the treasures and everything, even just rules. Uh, variations like there's one on how to deal with a particularly sticky combat situation that he offers a way of quickly resolving it in the back those appendices are lifesavers oh yeah so shall we rate this sucker? yeah let's give it some dragons we'll start with you glenn um four four dragons Okay. Four. I like it. I like it a lot. I could I could kickstart a campaign. I don't know if my players stay in Whisper Vale. <laughs> after all that, it's like, holy oh. crap, this is bigger than us. Let's get out of here. <laughs> Screw <laughs> this. We're out of here. Yeah. What? You're supposed to help these people. <laughs> yeah, we we're going to help them by we going did. into the big city and letting some higher level characters know about <laughs> this. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we shouldn't gripe much, Liz. We killed a campaign that I way. I know. Uh, let's, let's <laughs> we were just so tired. Let's go fight that red dragon. That should be easier than this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jim. Uh, I want to give it a five, but I'm going to go 4.5. I'm just taking off half a point because the campaign setting part of it is not my personal cup of tea. Just in general, not this product specifically. I mean, the module and everything mm -hmm. else, I, it would be a solid five. But I've, I've never given out a five, so I'm not going to start. 4.5. Okay. Bad Mike. Well, I'm not shy about fives. So I'll throw that out there. Um, yeah, I think it was a five. That the My gripes this were so minor. Uh, I think maybe one or the two of the maps were a little blurry. I mean, that, if that's the worst thing you can find about a module um, or a box set or a supplement, that's a pretty good set. So I, I'd, I'd hardly recommend this. I'd say five. Okay. Liz. I am going to just totally fangirl here and give it a five as well. Um, as we've all said, more or less, you can take this as is with the rule book of your choice and immediately start doing stuff. The miniatures that come with the, the big box set that we have, you know, they're not just random minis. They are miniatures of some of the basic or the major players in the adventure setting that he gives. You've got the druid with her bear. You've got, you know, some of the goblins, you know, individuals that your players are, are going to definitely run into when they play through this. You've got the minis for them, so you can set them down and, you know, give them a visual reference. So I thought that was a very nice touch. 
and a good reason to have miniatures rather than just, well, here's a game. I want to have miniatures. Let's have just some standard adventurers and, you know, a handful of monsters. Right. You know, he had these made, you know, to be the NPCs. So it's it's a good it's a good call and I'm giving it a five. I love it. Okay. Well, I don't. I'm disappointed he didn't paint the miniatures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if he painted them, you would have hated the colors he chose. Bastard. <laughs> you want him? To humbug. Come over, humbug. Uh, like him to come over and run it for you too? <laughs> well, hey, if he's offering, you know. <laughs> Liz, Liz. Yeah. Uh, when uh, when mine showed up, there was an extra envelope, and he put a baseball cap and like a whole blister of topuses, like ten topuses miniatures. <laughs> And, because, and we got four. And because they they showed up at work, I, got none. I started I started using them as well, motivational what? tools, <laughs> like cigarettes in prison. And there's besides my boss, there's no other gamers at school, but everybody wants that little topus, so they'll do crazy stuff for it. Only, I got one he handed to me last year. Oh man, baseball cap. To, oh man. Yeah, we didn't get a baseball cap. Yeah, no yeah, baseball uh, cap for us. It. But yeah, we got a billion of those little topuses. <laughs> I got none. I got one last year. He handed to me at the con. That was it. Uh, do we still have any extras, Mike? I know we gave some to Chase and them. We have two. It's like we can we wow. can give we gave two away. We've got two. Yes. Oh, oh watch! I'm going to go with the con. He's going to like give me a box load of topuses. Here. <laughs> well, you better give him the mirror image spell then. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. He may, he, may, he may have an extra hat for you because I don't think his head's going through any doorways after this review. Oh my. <laughs> Anyway, I guess the best thing I can say about this is one of the main characters is a gnome, and I would leave him in there if I ran it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I kill it. Dump him, because even making him a dwarf or a halfling would just lose something, I think. They just got make you. him a sleazy little gnome. They is got just... to you, man. They got to you. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think he is. I think he's, he's brainwashing me. That that was worth not interrupting you. That was great. Thanks. Yeah, that 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 was it's harsh, but there it is. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna give it a four. I mean, it's screw it, a four point five. It's really, good. I really liked it. I, I'm, I would love to run this. This is just a ton of fun. I like the dwarves in cleft. It's like, like Mike was saying, it's got lots of. Lots of character, yeah. To, without burying you in it. Parliamentary point of procedure. I I, I I move for a second round of dragons, and we just all agree it's a five. <laughs> no, oh no, no, because I want Zach to know who rated it a five and who didn't when it comes convention time, and perhaps freebies are flying freely through the conventions. Does that mean I'm going to get less drinks out of here? <laughs> yeah, because that would make Liz Glenn as the lowest up. grade, actually, for once. Well, no, that Zach said he was buying for the Save or Die crew at North Texas, but we were talking about frogs, and so I said, you buying what, frogs? Let's be a little more specific here. And he said, well, the specificity is going to depend on how my <laughs> how my setting comes oh. out on the review. <laughs> it's like Liz and I will be doing okay, and Mike's going to be in the corner there nursing yeah. a cold, you know, a warm Budweiser. Or something. Like, well, what about Glenn? He gave it. A he's going to get a frog. <laughs> oh, Glenn won't even be in the room. He's, he won't wake Glenn up. He'll be well, sleeping. Well, if he's going to buy us a, round, a couple rounds of drinks, make it sure it's during Bad Mike's B1 game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the kidding. Help his role-playing, yeah. Yes. Yeah, help help yeah, my he'll rolling. Be, he'll be rolling. Okay, it's all over let's the see. Place. That's two fives, two 4.5s, and a four, which comes out to 2.2. <laughs> what? <laughs> You're making my brain bleed, man. Cut it out. <laughs> I think it's about a 4.5, a yeah. little higher. Sounds good. Yeah. I was just trying to be the Russian judge, Five, you know. Two, seven, three. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Will it make any happier? Like I hate to come across as 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 you know, just being all fanboyish. But at the same time, it's like I feel dumb hunting hard for bad things to talk about. That's not fair either. I, I did I'm the, totally I, fangirling. And, and, I, I, make I no did four point fives because <laughs> lately I thought I'd been slinging around the fives too much. Oh. So I was like, well, let's back off about yeah, a half. In a my day. defense, I wouldn't even give DCC RPG a solid five. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I was I was almost going to go to a four, but then the more I thought about Topas, it was like ah, four point five. Yeah. 
He's worth a half a point. Da-da-da. Yeah. Yeah, he's a short guy. But <laughs> now, can speaking I ask my of, Speaking of dirty gnomes, it's time to head down the. Can I? Can I ask my question now? Oh sure, sure. I'm, I'm dying to hear the question. Dad, Mike, is is Zach is is? Do you know if Zach's going to have any product at the con of this? Oh, it's funny you mentioned that, Glenn. Said yes. Yeah. Um, he's actually going to have a booth at the convention this year, and yes, he'll be selling product there. And I'm not sure, but he may be selling something that's not available yet. I'm yeah, not I was positive. Ask, is there going to be new product? Mm, there might be, but uh, I don't want to go on record saying it. Oh, sure, I, but... I will. Will it be a version of this that? <laughs> for Pathfinder? <laughs> um, to be determined, I guess. Yeah. Uh, You're so, dying uh, to get into DCC, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, I'm gonna bring. Gotta have to bring some cash. It looks like. Yeah. Yeah. I've already planned on it. So if you don't uh, order the product from Lesser <clears throat> Gnome, then bring some money to the con. Will be available, and I bet you can get it signed by Lloyd and um, and Jeff and Zach. While you're there, I'll probably there be bringing go. my copy to get signed by all. Yeah, them. they'll sign anything though. Oh yeah. <laughs> and if you're really lucky, maybe Zach will share some Topaz stories with you. Yeah. Or unlucky. Or unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. We love you, Zach. And so it comes to that time once again, where we head down the dusty road of Bill Bixby-dom. Oy. With the music in the background. And how are we tromping down that road? Jim. I would like to go back to your place for some bouncy bouncy. <laughs> <laughs> With his translation quill. That's right. Oh, <laughs> quill correspondence there. <laughs> Glenn? I am trucking down the road with Spiny Norman on a leash. Mm. Making everybody else get out of the way or you get stung. Because there's leash laws where you are, yeah. That is true. Yep. Les? Well, I'm going to be going down the road with my pack of gaunt-swept scavengers. Um, Never did get to talk about them on the show, but they're basically, if kobolds had dogs... These would be them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bad Mike? I'm skipping along holding uh, the sweetheart of the OSR's hand as we uh, gallop into the sunset. Oh, you and Mike are so cute together. Yeah, I know. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh. I thought you meant, I, I, I thought you <laughs> meant Doug. <laughs> <laughs> you and Doug either. were going down the road. Whereas <laughs> all of you are walking, I'm riding proudly on the wagon... The rather bumpy wagon with the Temperance Society. <laughs> Need the one that has the beer inside that they don't know about? <laughs> no, of course not. That would oh, be okay. wrong. No, it, it it's be wrong. lemonade. It, yeah. Mike's yeah. hard lemonade. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, right. And he's being followed by hopped up goblins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that who they are? Goblins on drugs. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see you guys on the next episode. Which yep. should be an email show. That's See you right. then. Thanks for Good night, everybody. I appreciate it. It was wonderful. Yeah. Had a great time. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show, man. Thanks, thanks for thanks for bad. Thanks, man, Mike. See ya. Free arc. Bye bye. And we're out. The Saber Night Podcast is a production of Wild Games Productions in association with D20Radio.com. The Saber Night theme music is provided by the band Mississippi Bones. You can find them at mississippibones.bandcamp.com. Crunchy Frogs and other promotional considerations for tonight's episode were provided by Topus the Gnome and his pixie familiar. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Save or Die. I'm more than 20, like a 60